Good afternoon, team. My name is Carlos Rojas. I'm a volunteer organizer here at the Cosecha House in Boston. And today we're going to be learning the third module of uh, the one day training, which is called Our Weapon. Uh, and this is really about um, making our communities understand that the way that we're going to win is uh, through non cooperation. So let's get into the module right away. The picture that we have there is the Egyptian Revolution, which took place a couple of years ago. So basically, what is the function of the weapon module, right? So for participants, is really to understand that we will win through massive non-cooperation by leveraging our labor and economic power. And then for trainers is to understand that the monolithic versus social views of power and to understand that non-cooperation is our new theory of change. And the picture that you have there is a protest uh, in India against the construction of uh, a nuclear plant. Let's go to the next slide. So essentially when you're doing this module you want to start, the breakout is really uh, 10 minutes of a uh, story of self. Uh, and I'm going to uh, role play that for you. Then we're going to spend 40 minutes, right, uh, doing the pyramid exercise, uh, which I is, is the main practice uh, in this module. And then we're going to do another 10 minutes of report back. Uh, as a group and share what the experience was like. So right now I'm going to module the story of self uh, or something that you might want to do for this training. So good afternoon my name is Carlos Rojas I come from Peru I migrated to this country at the age of 12 uh, and I got involved in immigrant rights in 2009. Um, <laughs> I worked closely with United We Dream for three years, from 2009 to 2012. Uh, and then for the past three years, uh, from January uh, of 2013 to the end of 2015, I was working with the PICO National Network, uh, doing some in immigration work in Jersey, right? Uh, I want to share with you, earlier today, we shared our stories in the resonating session. We shared our values, and I want to share a story of immigrant rights in the U.S. So we're going to look at immigration for the past 15 years, right? Uh, and I want to start uh, with immigration in 2001. Uh, and what happened in 2001? Anybody? Yeah, that's right. So we had the 9-11 uh, attacks, right? Uh, not only uh, that created a lot of a feeling of unsafety in the U.S., but it also changed dramatically the way that immigration was viewed in this country, right? Uh, to the point that uh, immigration, CIR, immigration reform, uh, wasn't able, uh, it wasn't a topic, right, uh, that was seen with good eyes. We saw the INS changed to DHS, uh, and national security uh, became uh, a cornerstone of the immigration debate. Um, it was a really uh, time with uh, immigrants, not just from Latin America, but also from the Middle East, uh, were uh, seen as a threat to the nation, um, right? Uh, and the country focused on making the borders safer. Um, and now in 2006, uh, I would say that we reached the highest point of the anti-immigrant sentiment in the U.S. And that was when uh, a House or a member of the House of, of Representatives, right, uh, Congressman Sensorburner, introduced the 2006 Sensorburner Bill. Does anybody know what that is? Mm-hmm. Yes, so basically the Censor Burner Bill criminalized every single undocumented immigrant in the U.S. And then on top of that, it also criminalized any support that any resident or citizen provided for undocumented immigrants. Let me give you two examples. So if you were a landlord and you had tenants who uh, are undocumented, 
the undocumented tenants are labeled as criminals and you as a as a homeowner are also labeled as a criminal for supporting or providing housing for undocumented immigrants. <clears throat> now, if you're a mother and you pick up your children from school and you happen to give one of your children's friend a ride back home and the kid happened to be undocumented or the family happened to be undocumented, then you can also be charged as a criminal for providing transportation for an undocumented person. That's how tough this law was, right? And what was really scary is that in 2006, this actually became law. Uh, well, let, let me re rephrase that. It, it, it was actually passed by the House of Representatives. And then when it was on its way to the Senate, right, uh, the, the Spanish media, the American media, right, started talking about the consequences of this law to the point that it created a lot of fear, it created a lot of anxiety, right, within the immigrant community. And not just the immigrant community, but also um, anybody who thought themselves as an ally to undocumented immigrants. And this produced the largest marches in the history of the United States. So during uh, the second half of 2006 uh, and all the way till the summer of 2007, we had the largest marches in U.S. history. We had like two million people in L.A. We had over half a million people in New York City. Uh, and then combined in all these cities, we estimate that 30 to 40 million people marched. And that was the largest public demonstrations in the history of this country. Now, that changed the tone uh, of the immigration debate moving forward, and it really opened up a door uh, for immigration to be addressed in a different way. Now, from 2007 to 2016, it's been 10 years, right? We, as a, as a national movement or, or as a national emerging movement, we uh, created a um, a theory on how we were going to win immigration reform. And literally, it revolved around two main concepts. The first one, we were being told that we had to elect Democratic candidates. And we did it in 2008 with Obama. We did it in 2012 by re-electing President Obama. And we're being told that today in 2016, right? Uh, with Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. Now, the second part of that theory was that once we have these elected officials in the White House, right, that we have to put pressure in key moments to get them to give us what we want, which for the past 10 years has been comprehensive immigration reform. Now, 10 years later, that strategy hasn't really worked. And if we look at Obama's legacy, we have some relief in the form of DACA that benefited around 1.2% million uh, undocumented uh, young immigrants, right? Uh, we have DAPA, which is right now in the courts, and we don't really know what's going to be the future of that. We don't know if it's going to become a policy. We don't know what's going to happen in the courts. And then uh, we have 2.5 million deportations, um, right? Now, I'm sharing this story because it is important for all of us as a community that want to get involved to understand the history of immigration in this country, right? Uh, and now 2016, we're being told that we have to support Hillary, uh, who recently uh, said that uh, she was going to pass immigration reform in the first 100 days, right? But Cosecha believes that there's a different strategy, right? Uh, there's a different way to move forward. Uh, now, anybody knows Albert Einstein? Yeah, scientists, right? So Albert Einstein defined, right, uh, insanity as doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results, right? Uh, and literally, if we keep doing the same thing uh, and we don't get a different result, we really shouldn't be surprised at all. Um, so now, <clears throat> instead of really focusing on the political parties as the solution to immigration, uh, we're going to do an activity so that we can all understand where the real power uh, to get what we need could come from, which is our people. Okay, 
So at that point, I finished sharing the story of self that is going to transition into the pyramid uh, activity. Now, you can go about this two ways. When you go into the activity, you can build that pyramid that we have on, on the screen, right? Uh, you can either do it on a big butcher paper. Um, other ways that we, we have done it is that we, we, we have actually created the pyramid on the floor with tape for people to stand in front of, right? Uh, and basically, uh, we're going to start by having people around the pyramid. Uh, and we're going to start asking uh, some key questions. And there's actually, when, when you see this presentation, there's going to be a link to, to, the, to the script uh, and the guiding questions, which are going to help you go through the presentation. So let's get into the pyramid exercise right away. All right, everyone. So we're going to uh, pretend that we have this pyramid in the floor uh, made with tape and we have our uh, par participants that are going to, that are going to be ar around the pyramid <clears throat> and really uh, when we look at this pyramid what we are really sharing is that uh, in this pyramid we're gonna model the American system and currently how uh, the US is structured right um, so the first question that we're gonna ask is when you think of this country who are the people or the groups of people that have accumulated the most power and resources and literally after you ask that question you're gonna pause and you're gonna be quiet and wait for people to respond <clears throat> now some people are gonna say well we have uh, politicians right so you would go ahead you would grab a piece of paper you will write politicians and you're gonna have people stand in the pyramid at the top of the pyramid right people are gonna say well we have CEOs right there you go so that's the top of the pyramid people who control power and resources and some examples of that what people are going to say is that they're gonna say CEOs right they're gonna say um, they may say something like government but you want them to be specific who in government, they might say, well, senators or uh, members of Congress, right, or judges. Uh, you you want to make sure that you name the groups of people, not the institutions, not the systems, right? So after you get maybe like, I would say like five, six answers, could be CEOs, Wall Street bankers, the president, right? Um, Congress, millionaires, right? Uh, then you're gonna go into the next tier of the pyramid. And in this uh, level, you really wanna talk about the policies and the practices that have allowed such accumulation, right? Uh, and then people are gonna say something like slavery, you know, uh, cheap labor right uh, monopolies you know colonization racism discrimination you get the point right uh, deregulation you know <clears throat> uh, so you're really getting at what were the laws or the practices because some of them were illegal right that accumulating such uh, power segregation all that kind of stuff I would say after you get like another six to eight practices, then you're ready to go to the next step, <clears throat> um, which is what are the institutions and the systems that enforce these policies and practices, right? So where did this come from? And then you're going to say, what are the institutions and the systems that supported this? And then people are going to say, well, we have uh, the economic system. Yeah, absolutely. The economic system continues to perpetuate uh, the richer getting richer and the poorer getting poorer. Exactly. People may say, well, uh, there is the police, right? And they're like, yeah, yeah. You know, like if you try to do something against what's going on, then you're probably going to get the police after you. Now, um, people may name different things, 
right? They may say law enforcement, they may say uh, schools, universities, the media, right? Uh, they are going to give us things like law enforcement for the purposes of our practice because we're doing cosecha, right? Uh, we're talking about immigration. We want to make sure that we either fish for ICE, immigration enforcement, or if it's not coming up from the crowd, that we do it ourselves, right? But we need to name it. We need to say that ICE is an institution that continues to perpetuate these practices and, and, and policies, right? Because people are getting deported every day. <clears throat> now, I would say uh, you have 40 minutes for the whole pyramid. So don't feel rushed to go through this pyramid because you're going to have time at the end. We really want to make sure that we use all 40 minutes uh, to really uh, drill deep into the pyramid because people are going to have a lot of aha moments. They're going to have realizations, right? Uh, and also, uh, we want to make sure that we're guiding people to the right answers that we need, right? So, for example, you know, uh, if somebody says uh, the media right um, you want to ask a follow-up question specifically how and they might say something like well you know like we always have you know on TV like they don't really share the full story they portray undocumented immigrants uh, as criminals when we're really hard-working people you want to make sure that people are actually getting a chance to develop their answers if they're not clear right <clears throat> and then after we have the pyramid completed the question that we're going to ask, we're going to focus on the pillars, you know, those Roman pillars that we have. And we're going to ask, which are the communities, right? And let me put it on the screen for you. Uh, who are the communities that are supporting these systems and institutions, right? Now, people are going to realize that our immigrant community are at the bottom, right? So we will ask a question. Where does our immigrant community fit in this pyramid? Where are we? Right? Um, and then they might say, well, we're at the bottom of the pyramid. We're supporting the pillars. Right? Uh, and we want to ask follow-up questions like, how are we supporting this pyramid? How are we supporting those pillars? Right? Uh, they may say, well, you know, like, the corporations at the top uh, continue to to control power and resources because we keep consuming their products, right? So we are consumers, you know? We go to work every day. We send our kids to school. We pay taxes, that's huge, <clears throat> you know? Um, we provide cheap labor, you know? Um, Every time an undocumented person is detained, there are corporations that keep making money, right? And basically, what the main point out of this is that we want to get everyone to understand that it is our immigrant communities who are supporting, who are at the bottom of this pyramid and really become the base for the pyramid. And basically, to, uh, through our labor power and our consumer power, we are supporting this whole pyramid, right? Now, it is important to acknowledge that immigrants aren't the only ones at the bottom of the pyramid. So you might ask a question like, who else is at the bottom of the pyramid, right? People would say minimum wage workers, fast food workers, people of color, right? poor people in general, because there is a lot of uh, poor white people, uh, right? Uh, especially uh, as as you get into the interior of the country, <clears throat> right? Uh, yeah. Um, now, the follow-up to the exercise is really get them to understand and get them to imagine, really get, getting them to imagine what would happen to the pyramid if we would draw our support, right? So if we start pulling on the on these pillars and we're making them weaker, and what do we mean by that? What would happen if we, for example, uh, 
stop consuming from a specific corporation that would have an effect right so for example if immigrants now get to a place where they are not um, buying uh, uh, products at Walmart that has an effect in the whole pyramid right uh, if if immigrants are in, uh, working in the fields they are in working in their construction jobs right if caretakers are in uh, taking care of the elderly right what are the effects um, and basically um, if the agricultural workers are not working then then really nobody's picking up those vegetables and fruits right they're they get rotten right uh, so there's an effect to households there's also an effect to restaurants because they can't serve what they normally would right <clears throat> uh, if babysitters all of a sudden don't show don't show up to work what would happen right then maybe uh, lawyers Wall Street people doctors that rely on babysitters to take care of their children now can't go to work or they're in a situation where it's hard for them to go to war because they need somebody to take care of their children right uh, and we really want to get them to imagine what that looks like uh, essentially what we're saying is now if we are saying right that if we if migrants in mass numbers right we're talking about millions of people withdraw their support from the pyramid or choose not to contribute with the system right then everything falls apart that's what we want to uh, get them to understand and we also want people to understand that while the people at the top quote unquote have power uh, it is a power that people at the bottom are giving up right uh, and power more naturally flows from the bottom to the top. Now, if you're doing the exercise on a butcher paper, then the cool thing about it is that you can literally flip the pyramid and have our communities at the top, you know, uh, and get people to understand that we as a community have huge amounts of untapped power, right? Uh, if we're doing it uh, on the floor, just get everyone to turn around so that it is the people at the bottom really looking up the pyramid and say, imagine if we turn this uh, around, right? Um, now, that's basically the pyramid exercise. Um, after we have done this, right, uh, again, we have a script with questions uh, that you can use to guide a conversation and also some tips that, that we have for you. Uh, but now, um, I actually wanna uh, pause here uh, and just say that after this exercise is done, uh, depending on time, right, uh, you can have people break into their circles, um, circles of four or five, and share some some key highlights, uh, and do that for, for about 10, 15 minutes. Now, if you're short on time, then you can just go straight into a group discussion. So you get people to go from the pyramid back to their seats and just share some highlights, right? Uh, and then you, you might get uh, answers like, oh, wow, like our immigrant community has re really has a lot of power. Or, yeah, you know, um, if, um, if we do uh, a mass strike, then we can change the game. Right. Um, so that's basically the the outcome. Uh, again, uh, we want uh, we want to do the the exercise in a way that everyone in the room understands non cooperation, right, uh, and also understands uh, our true power as uh, as our labor power and also our con consumer power. <clears throat> now I'm gonna go to the bonus section. Right now, I, I want to be clear, this is not for the training, so this is not a part of the training, but it is something for the trainers who are leading these sessions to really understand. And it is about the views of power, right? Um, now, when I shared my story, and when I, and I, I, I was talking that the strategy has really been 
to elect Democrats and put points of pressure. I was talking about this next slide, right? That for the past 10 years, immigration reform in this country has focused on the elected officials at the top, right? <clears throat> so this is, has been our current theory of, of change. We will win by electing the Democratic ca candidates and pressuring them in key moments, right? That view of power, that power, that the elected officials hold power, that is what we call uh, in, in, in mo momentum, right? Uh, a monolithic view of power. Now, if we have done the exercise correctly, right, what we are suggesting is that there's a different way to view power, which is that power comes from the community, right? And that is Cosecha's theory of change, that we will win through massive non-cooperation by leveraging our labor and consumer power. And that's what we call a social view of power. So now, we're not mentioning any of this, but this is just helpful for you as a trainer to understand that this module is also helping us transition from a monolithic view of power to a social view of power. And we're not saying that one is better than the other, right? Cosecha feels that we have to go with social, but the reason why we say that is because there are already many organizations that are focusing on the elected officials, and really nobody is focusing on leveraging our community power, all right? Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Uh, that's the presentation uh, in, a, in a nutshell. Again, uh, 10 minutes story of self, uh, well, story of immigration in the U.S., uh, and you can tie that to your personal story. Uh, there's a pyramid exercise, which is 40 minutes. Uh, and then, de depending on time, you can do a small circle breakout, or you can just go straight into a group di discussion. So, 10, 40, 10. So, you need at least one hour for this module. Uh, and you can make it an hour and 15 minutes if you want to add the, the group discussion. Um, yeah. I would also have trainer's notes al along with this, uh, guiding questions. Uh, to make this easier. So I hope you rock it. I hope you rock uh, our weapon, uh, which is a really, really, really powerful module uh, to really get our people to understand, uh, again, uh, the power of the immigrant community through non-cooperation. Peace out. Yo, how do I stop it? Oh, sorry. There's a little record button up here. Mira. Mira. Hold on, hold on. It's finishing because I'm a kind of one. What happened? Look there. Oh.